Yeah. The good news is, Skeet Reese is not fishing, <laughs> and I've hired someone to break Kevin's legs. The classic's going to be great. The classic, man, I'll tell you, from when I was, honestly, from when I was 14 or 15 years old, to now, I, the classic's the most unbelievable thing I've ever about. I mean, I can, I can remember being, remember the old Bob Cobb bass yeah. I saw on TV? Wasn't that the best? Yeah. Wait, what was it? Sunday morning? Saturday morning? So, Sunday, like, Sunday afternoon. Sunday afternoon. I get like a bowl of popcorn. And then, like, you know, wait, and I can remember vividly the sound of the show coming on. <laughs> Bob Cobb was like, And today, Paris Master, Rick Quan does magic mushrooms. <laughs> but I was excited, and I can remember as a kid getting chills, chills, watching guys be pulled into the arena to fish this event. <coughs> That's how I grew up. I grew up, you know, the, the classic for me was the Super Bowl. You know, it was what I always dreamed about. And now it's it's almost surreal that I've had an opportunity to be a part of it. You know, a lot of years. And uh, so I me mean, going into the classic, it's awesome. It's a great feeling, you know, it's, it's an accomplishment to get there. But I'll tell you, the interesting thing about the classic is it's a different mentality than a normal event. In a normal tournament, you go into the tournament thinking, I can win, and I'm going to find a way to fish. And then if you go out and have the first bad day, your mind instantly goes, I need to go catch some fish to get some points. I need to qualify to get to the fight. You know, in a normal tournament, it's qualifying. You can't have a bad event. But in the classic, you think I'm going to find a way to fish, and I'm going to I'm going to fish for the one to fish. Do or die. That's a great feeling to put it all on the line. To swing. I love that style of turn. You know, there's no second place. There's no top ten. There's only first place. The classic fishing on the Red River is going to be a pre-spawn pattern, right? Pre-spawn fish. So let's talk about seasonal pattern. What are the four seasonal patterns the bass lives in? Go one. Spring, summer, fall, winter. Four seasonal patterns, right? Winter, the bass, right? These are all gentles now. Wintertime pattern. The bass are in the deepest, most vertical break areas of the lake. They're in the deepest, most vertical break areas of that section of the lake they're fishing. Spring, broken into three parts. Pre-spawn, spawn, spawn post-spawn, okay? Main thing to remember in the spring, they got one thing on their mind. What's that? Spawn it, baby. Spawn it. I mean, you know, push it off the shelf. <laughs> Summertime. Summertime. Deeper, thicker. Current. Fall. Two periods of the fall. Early fall, what we call the fall feed, and then late fall, fall transition. Fall transition, the fish are going back to their winter spot, deep vertical breaks. The Bass Master Classic in two weeks will be a pre spawn pattern. It'll be fish wanting to get to where they're going to spawn. And, and actually, this is a real good visual way to explain it. So, you know, you've got these backwater lakes on the Red Bull River, you've got these backwater oxbows, and there's deep areas in these oxbows where they win. The deepest, most vertical break areas in these oxbows. And in uh, January and early February, even though it hasn't been much of a winter, those fish that are in that winter pattern are out in that deeper water. And here's what they do. You ready? They're looking that way. And what they're looking at is they're looking up to those shallow spawning flats, right? They're looking for the protected little bays and cuts, the protected areas that are shallow and have a, a nice spawning bottom. That's what they're looking for. So in the pre-spawn, those fish are wanting to be there. That urge to spawn, every one of them has that biological instinct to go, to go up there. And the key now, then, in the pre-spawn is to figure out how these fish that are out here get to that spawn, right? So the key to the classic is going to be figuring out that route that they take to get up to the spawn place. Do those fish, when they're out here in deep water, do they pop their head up? and look at that spawning flap and travel in a random motion to get up to the spawning flap? Do they do that? They don't, right? They don't travel randomly across this flap to get to that spawning cove. 
How are they going to travel? To where are they going to go to head to that spawning pod? We can't all Keep saying it, because they're all saying the same thing. I heard weed edge, I heard channel, I heard break, I heard wood. They're going to travel along change. Change. Same thing we talked about in the early part of the seminar. So on these flats, and this is, this is how the guys are going to win, there's little tiny things that run through them that are ditches, right? And here's all they are. So you get on a flat, the whole flat for a mile is two foot deep. But in one area on that flat, you're going to have a ditch or a drain, which is an old creek, and it's only going to be that much deeper than the rest of the flat. Think about how subtle that is, right? So for two miles, you've got two feet of water. But in one area, as wide as this table, that snakes up along that flat, instead of being two foot, it's 2.8. How subtle that is, that's the key. And they'll travel along those ditches, those breaks, in some places, it's a channel. In some places, it's a weed edge. In some places, it's a dock line. They're going to travel along those areas of change to get to that spawn. And that's going to be the key in the class. It's finding the right one of those that are the right fish. So I'm excited. I'm excited. And again, you know, you fish that tournament to win. I can tell you that uh, this year is the first year that in Vegas, you could actually bet on the classic. You can gamble on it. Put your money over there, baby. I'm going to win. <laughs> Next question. <laughs> the question is the Alabama rig. I, you know what? I'm going to ask y'all on this one. Show of hands. Show of hands. Let's start on this side. How many people are in favor of How many people know what the Alabama rig is? Okay, not half of you. Of you guys, how many people favor the Alabama rig? On this side. <laughs> he doesn't favor but he wants to try. <laughs> Make that answer. Okay, how many on this side favor the Alabama rig? Okay, so not many. So, you know, the Alabama rig is an umbrella rig. It's, you tie your line to a, a fixed position, and then off of that fixed position, you've got three to five wires, and off of those wires, you've got a bait on each wire. It's actually a really old technique, you know, more in salt water than you guys, you know, up here, guys have been fishing spikers like that forever. And it's, yeah. Same thing. And it's really caught on in the bass world. It kind of caught second wind in Alabama and Tennessee for guys fishing swim baits behind them and really catching them pretty good, especially when the fish are pretty up and they're off the back. And you know, right now in the fishing industry, it's probably the biggest buzz topic because guys are either very for it or very against it. Very against it because it's unethical, because it's more than one bait at one time. Damage the environment, it can hurt the fish. For it, because it's a new technique, it's exciting, it's something to try. You can catch two or three fish on one cast. It's breathed new life into the industry. It's going to grow the sport. I'm, I'm, I'm staying neutral on it. You know, I, honestly, I, my, if I, if you were to ask me before everything happened with this, I'd go by the state law. If you got to a state and they allowed three hooks, I think you should be able to use three. If they allowed two, you should be able to use two. Have you played um, with it yet, though? The elite competition room, so we don't have to worry about that. A couple more questions. Hydro wave work. Great question. Uh, the question was about hydro wave. Anybody know what hydro wave or the old biosound machine is? Yeah. Okay. Real quick, it's a little box about that big. It costs about two or three hundred dollars. You hook it up, you run the cable down your trolling motor on the back of the boat, and it makes noises. Anybody watched the movie Shamu before? Did you ever hear a whale noise? It's like, it really does. I mean, it sounds ridiculous, but it makes bait fish type noises. I'm not sponsored by Hydro Wave, but to give honest opinion, it works really, really good 30% of the time. <laughs> Think about that. No, I'm serious. I'm serious. It works really, really good 30% of the time. So if you're a guy that fishes a lot, you're a tournament guy, you fish a lot, do you want someone on your boat that works 30% of the time? Mm -hmm. I do. Absolutely. And here's when it really works. When those fish are off the bank, if they're you know on a weed edge, on a rock pile, they're out off the bank. When they're grouped up, and when they're specifically when they're feeding on bait, they're feeding on some kind of bait fish, that's when it's at its best. Right? So post-spawn, 
through that early fall, that fall feed, it can be really good. It can be really good, and I've seen it work like a charm. The biggest thing, I think, with the Hydra Wave, like changing colors of crankbait, like changing from a worm to a jig, what's the biggest thing with using something that creates sound? Is it's changing the environment, right? And here's how I use mine. I've had it on my boat since 2008. When I get to a place, and I know you're living offshore, you're on a little rock pile or a hook, I start fishing without it on. And I'll fish through it, I'll try to catch a couple, catch a couple, it'll shut down, and I'll turn it on. And then all, almost every time, it ignites the fish. It changes the environment, right? It makes it something new, something curious. I'll leave it on for 30 minutes, 40 minutes, an hour. I'll turn it off. I'll fish again with it off. And I'll turn it back, and I'll use it intermittently to change the environment of the fish. And that's kind of what we've been doing for years with changing our baits, right? So I do, I believe, I believe. By the way, um, if anybody's interested, you know, we've got uh, kind of a secondary seminar going on called the Bash University. We, we're selling one-day passes for tomorrow, if you're interested. We've got more classes the rest of the year. Go to bashuniversity.com. Somebody's got pro shores somewhere around here in the back of the room. Uh, if you're interested, come check us out. We've got a booth on the show floor. Let's take like two more questions and then we'll call it. Let's talk about uh, Champlain a little bit. Absolutely. Kind of beautiful fish like Champlain. Awesome. One of the best lakes in the country. Uh, yeah, Champlain. You want to talk about the north end, the south end, the whole lake? Who? Who? Hero. North Hero Island? Yeah. On top? Yeah. Okay. The north end of the lake. Uh, Plattsburgh, Burlington, up top. It's a great area because here's Champlain in a nutshell for me. Is you've got, it, it's broken down to three sections. You've got the, the northern third, you've got the southern third, and then you've got that big middle section, just big old water middle section. That middle <coughs> section has more big smallmouth in it. There's just giant smallmouth that are untouched. The bottom end of the lake has big largemouth. Ty Cod Road, a great area for big largemouth. That northern third, that's around the heroes, it's a great area because it's got the best of both worlds. It's amazing smallmouth fish, amazing largemouth fish, all in the same spot. Um, I can tell you the number one thing, with exception to the spawn, because again, when, when it's spawn time for those fish, all they're thinking about is, right? The number one thing in smallmouth fishing for me there is the bait, specifically the yellow perch. And I, you know, when you find the perch, when you find the bait, the owl white, whatever that bait is they're eating, then you find the smallmouth. You know, so June into July, they're still up around where they spawn, they're starting to slide back out at, you know, five, ten foot zone. It's awesome. As the summer progresses and it gets hot, as you see those yellow perch start to move deeper, they spawn on the follow. You know, they'll go from that 10 foot zone to 20, even in the 30, by the heat of, heat of the summer. Again, summertime pattern, deeper, deeper, thicker current. So there's your deeper. And then in the fall again, depending on the year, usually about September, sometimes it's a late fall into early October, interesting thing happens, which is the water temperature starts dropping again. When that water temperature starts falling, all those perch that were 20 and 30 foot deep in the summer, where do they go again? Right back up. You see them in the same place as they were in June and early July, which is the shoals and flats, that zero to 10 foot range. All of a sudden, those big walls of perch are back up shallow. And guess who's following? The wolf packs. Those, those small mouth right behind them. Um, large mouth fishing, you know, large mouth fishing on, on that place for me is, um, it's always about two things. It's about, it's about weeds, and it's about fishing isolated hard cover. You know, if you watch Dave Wallach, the pro, who's had phenomenal success up there, if you've ever watched some of the video when he, he wins, he's winning on what we consider community stuff. It's a bridge pine, it's a dock, it's a big tree on a flat, and he's fishing hard targets, which is a large amount of love. And the other thing's weeds, you know. Um, the interesting thing about Champlain on weed fishing is it's got miles and miles of weeds, and it's hard to figure out where those fish are at. And one of the things I'm a big advocate of is using the bait to find the fish. So a lot of times on Champlain, even so on the south end, Ticonderoga, you get down there and you look, it's two miles of an outside weed edge, weed edge of Milford. Two miles of it. Where the heck? You idle down it, don't see nothing on the ground, looks different. How are you going to find those fish? It's needle in the haystack. 
I'm going to take a search bait. There's three search baits that I use when I'm trying to find fish. I'm going to take a, a diving crankbait, a Carolina rig, or in this situation, when you've got that much weed, I'm going to take a big heavy jig, three quarter, a half ounce, three quarter, or one ounce jig, and I'm going to find the fish with my bait. You know, all this technology, and it's great, Biosonics and Lorance, amazing technology that can help you with tangle. But let's not forget about the basics, which is to use the bait to find the fish. So that two mile weed edge, 10 to 12 foot outside weed edge, hike on the road, it's end of July. I'm going to drop my trolling motor, I'm going to get my three quarter ounce jig, and I'm going to go down that weed edge. I'm going to pitch from that far back, that far in front of the weed edge. I'm going to keep going. A lot of times I'm a, I'm a mile down from having that bike. Let the jig sink down, hit the bottom, shake it a couple times, and reel back in, make another flip. Fall back down, shake it a couple times, reel back in, make another flip. All of a sudden, I'm a mile up, all of a sudden, from what? I got my first bite. Three pounds, put it in the boat. As I'm reeling that fish in, I do this. What do I just do? Karate kick! <laughs> awesome. I kick the marker boat. It's like a dollar at Big Sporting Goods. Please invest in one if you want to vote. Kick that boat. Finish fighting that fish, put it in the boat. Look at it, look at the strokes, do all the things I need to do, let it go. Nine times out of ten, when I make a pitch back to the same spot, what happens before the jig ever gets up? Going, whack! Got another one. And what I found is I found something key in that two miles of what we look, what it visually looked like, two miles of endless, the same, we found something super key. And we found it with the bait. Sometimes you feel it. Sometimes you pitch a jig out there and it gets crunchy or you feel snag or something. But most times the fish tell you they're there. And nine times out of ten, you get two or three bites, and the reason you do that is there's something different in that weed line. Change. In fact, that same word. Straight weed line, straight weed line, all of a sudden in one little spot, it goes in, it makes a cut. Or it sticks out. Or there's a little rock pile there. So I've used the bait to find, to find a new change. Okay, I'm going to end here. Before I end it, I need, uh, need a volunteer. Do you want to come up? Uh, I said it earlier, and I'm going to say it again. We all love fishing, right? It's a super sport. Listen, I get this question all the time. People say, man, how do we go to the sport? You know, oh, it's, no, nobody's fishing anymore. Nobody's hunting anymore. Oh, oh, oh. Listen, one way we're going to grow the sport is get people excited about the sport, get people to feel like we feel about fishing, is to get kids involved. It's the only way. I'm telling you, my family never did it. I would never never be here. I, who knows? I grew up back in South Philadelphia. Who knows? I'd be right graffiti on the wall still breaking. Oh, I do that right now. <laughs> <laughs> get kids involved. If it's a nephew, if it's a son, if it's a neighbor, if it's a friend, take them out. Go find a fish. Go jack them some brand. Go, go do anything. That's the only way we're going to grow the sport. Do you agree? Okay. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thanks, guys.